Welcome to the SeizeYourBusiness.com podcast. My name is Kevin O'Flaherty from O'Flaherty Law, and I'm here with my guest, Troy Golden from Golden Group Real Estate. He's uh, one of our first return guests, and his uh, previous uh, episode, the which dealt with a systematic approach to sales, was one of the most popular we've had, and in fact, the most popular we've had. So we asked him back to do a systematic approach to sales part two, which is going to be our topic today. So we're going to go into a little bit more depth on his last podcast. So, you, you know, if you don't really care about building blocks, uh, then go ahead and listen to this episode. Otherwise, you may want to check out uh, the previous podcast we did. It was, it was episode six, I believe, uh, and it was one of our one of our best. So thanks for being here today with us. Troy. Thanks for having me, Kevin. So for people who are just tuning into this episode for the first time, why don't you tell everybody what you do and kind of a little sure. bit of background. Uh, I'm a commercial real estate broker. Uh, specialize in tenant representation for office users in the western suburbs of Chicago. Basically, what that means is uh, I help businesses find office space and then negotiate the lease or uh, purchase contract. Uh, so my clients uh, tend to be business owners, and uh, that's kind of the uh, perspective I'm coming from uh, when uh, I'll be talking about uh, my prospecting system for the rest of this presentation, uh, how I try to approach business owners or C-suite level executives, how I build those relationships. Uh, my sales cycle is uh, very long term because usually a lease doesn't come up. Uh, for three to seven years, sometimes ten years, and uh, it's a very large uh, contract that they're signing. Uh, it's a big expense item, uh, and coming from that perspective, uh, it takes a certain approach. It's relationship sales, and uh, I've developed a what I call a systematic sales approach for relationship sales, and I'd like to talk a little bit about uh, what I do, it's very applicable to people who are brokers, but also applicable to anyone who's prospecting in relationship sales in general or looking to develop relationships with decision makers. And you never talk about this without being prodded to talk about it because you're a very <laughs> humble guy, but talk about your, your background a little bit because it's really interesting. Oh, one. sure, sure. Uh, well, I... And I grew up in uh, another in the South, in North Carolina. Uh, went to Yale uh, for undergrad. Uh, then after graduating, uh, worked on political campaigns for a number of years, which is actually relevant because uh, that background is kind of how I developed my uh, the approach that I'll be talking about here today. And, uh, and I'll go into that in more detail later, but when I first developed this approach, I used a lot of the techniques I uh, learned on the campaign trail uh, to meet and develop relationships with business owners. Uh, it, it seems counterintuitive at first, but being a campaign manager is a lot like uh, – being a sales or selling to decision makers. Uh, there really are a lot of the same, you employ a lot of the same strategies. And I'll go over that later on in the presentation or in our discussion. And uh, after uh, working on the political campaigns for a number of years, eventually managing a state house race uh, in my home state, North Carolina, I kind of aged out of the system and uh, decided to go into commercial real estate. Uh, my last candidate, he was a real estate developer and went to uh, University of Wisconsin where I got my MBA and uh, moved here about five years ago where I met you. You were my first client. Yeah, and you did a great job for him. <laughs> still in, still in that lease. Yeah, got you into the <laughs> space, and uh, kind of developed the system that we'll go over today. 
uh, really using a lot of my previous experience as a political campaign manager. Uh, I didn't have a lot of ties to the area, uh, so I had to build up my, uh, I guess, my knowledge of the market and potential prospects from the ground up. Uh, and it was, it was an interesting experience, but it's worked out really well for me. It's a great market here, and I've had, had a wonderful time doing it. Well, and, and you have a PowerPoint that kind of ties into this presentation and some slides, so if people want to see that, Troy asked me to integrate it with the video for the website, but I was far too lazy to do that, <laughs> so it is going to be on your LinkedIn profile? Yes. And you can get to that from your website, right? Yes. Uh, I strongly recommend that uh, people look at this PowerPoint presentation I put together just because there's a really neat diagram that kind of outlines everything and makes it everything easier to follow. Uh, if you look up my name on LinkedIn, Troy Golden, uh, or just email me, I'll go to my website. What's your website? Uh, Golden Group C R E. The last letters are C R E as in commercial real estate. So it's Golden Group C R E dot com. Uh, you'll find my email there. Email me, ask me, I'll send you the slides. Uh, the PowerPoint presentation will uh, outline everything, and you can follow along uh, as we go over the system uh, in this interview. And I'll I'll have a link to uh, to Troy's website and his email on our our show page too at CaesarBusiness.com. So so without further ado, uh, why don't you kind of go through and let's dig in a little deeper on our last conversation. Sure. Well, uh. If, if you're following along in the uh, PowerPoint presentations, you'll see the first slide is a diagram that will kind of outline everything we'll go over. And there's basically four major pillars uh, uh, to the system. First, this systematic approach involves building and then later a continuously updating uh, prospect database. And this is kind of the foundation uh, of the way I like to sell. Uh, and we'll, we'll go over uh, the details of how I did this and how others can do this as well. But uh, the, in order to uh, create a database successfully, uh, one needs to specialize uh, for me, as a commercial real estate broker, uh, it meant actually canvassing uh, the buildings and on the ground finding out who was actually in the properties that might not apply to other businesses. So when you say you need to specialize, that's because if you don't narrow down the database, you're just going to be overwhelmed with people who aren't applicable to what you do. So if, I, if I'm a general practitioner, which I am, I need to... Even if I want to stay a general practitioner, I need to figure out which area I want to market to for the database. Something like new home buyers, if I want to do, you know, estate plans or something like that. Uh, precisely, I and mean, there's many ways to specialize. There's, as I'll, I'll just use my own industry uh, for an example, but uh, whoever's listening to this, they can apply these principles to whatever they do. As a commercial real estate broker, I can specialize by property type, by uh, geography, by whether I'm representing the landlord or the tenant. Uh, as a lawyer, you could be, I mean, I think you do a little bit of everything, but you like to be the local. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, Your the, community yeah, law firm. Exactly. Yeah. Um, so when you are, when you're kind of marketing to people, you probably don't go after a lot of people in other states. Sure. Uh, it's kind of the same thing, or there's basically four reasons to specialize. Um, one, it strengthens your brand, and that's kind of what we've been getting at. Uh, and two, it's just for practical reasons. It's make you need to specialize in order to create a database because it becomes overwhelming if you're not specialized. If you uh, you can't do, you couldn't be an attorney. Uh, that's a general practitioner for every state 
in the U.S. or every country in the world. Otherwise, the database becomes meaningless. Sure. And just impossible to do. Um, three, uh, it allows you to send targeted marketing pieces. Uh, you can collect information that's relevant to the people in your database and uh, elicit a response. Uh, as a broker, for example, since I uh, specialize in office users in the western suburbs, if I find out something relevant, like uh, rents, office rent rates are going up, and then I have a database of office tenants, they'll be interested in that. But if I had a database of, you know, retail tenants, they might not be as interested. They may, but they're not going to be as interested. Mm -hmm. And then for, this is kind of like number two, but it just makes it a lot easier and more practical to collect market data. Sure. Uh, the, you just, you kind of have to specialize, and I don't mean to rule out being a, you can be a generalist, but then you, in what you do, but then you have to specialize in the area that you target. Yeah, you have to pick a marketing campaign and, and go with it. You know, when you do Google AdWords or something like that, you know, for me, I don't just try to pick the word attorney. I'll pick, you know, Downers Grove divorce attorney right. and narrow it down because that's a smaller field to compete in and it's less of a marketing budget to compete in that field. Exactly. So, in this, I, I was talking before about, uh, you know, my experience as a campaign manager. This kind of gets back to what we're seeing, or what I saw as a political uh, campaign manager. I mean, you see this on your TV screen today. Uh, Donald or, Trump? Donald Trump, exactly. <laughs> you know, Donald Trump has chosen his specialty as a guy who will, like, he'll say anything. And, mm -hmm. you know, he's the truth teller. He's, no one's ever going to be to the right of mm -hmm. Donald Trump. And then... Uh, there are the establishment guys, and then you know Bernie Sanders. He's always going to be to the left. No one's ever going to be to the left of Bernie Sanders. And Hillary Clinton is the moderate in the Democrat primary. So they they choose their brand, and then they go after uh, or they pursue that identity. And then well, that's why Donald Trump can say you know things like he doesn't want to allow Muslims to re-enter the United States. And still keep his, you know, 32 percent or wherever he's at, because that's his heart. That's his. He, he knows yeah. what his target market is, and he's trying to appeal to that target market. Exactly. Exactly. So once you've decided what your target is, uh, you have to find people who meet that criteria. Uh, that, for me, that meant actually on the ground or finding those people visually. Uh, walking through buildings, saying, okay, this tenant's here, they meet my criteria, and then going back to my office and doing internet research to confirm information. For other industries, it could mean other things. Uh, there could be other means. But as a, I'll go over what I did, and then people can apply these lessons as they may or may not apply. Uh, as an office tenant rep broker, uh, it makes sense for me to target prospects who are over a certain size, under a certain size, and locally based. Uh, so I basically watch through every major building in my market, uh, create a list of every tenant that was worth going after, but not so big that they wouldn't go with me because they were international mm -hmm. companies or national companies. And then I did internet research to confirm uh, who the contact was and what the contact information was. Uh, as a attorney or a, someone in another industry, there could be certain lists you could buy or other means of finding this information. Uh, but in general, there's a certain principle that applies. Uh, the more scarce a piece of information, the more valuable. Yeah, because if there's a list out there, everybody's got the list and everyone's cold calling that list. Exactly. Uh, I kind of did things the hard way because 
I, I was just willing to invest the time. Uh, there's a couple, I mean, you can either invest time or money in building your database. And uh, I borrowed a bunch of money and then invested about a year in building up my database. Uh, but you can either buy information and then slowly build off of it, or you can hire someone that you trust uh, and then have them build it for you, or you can buy a list. Uh, but in general, the kind of there's a balance between scarcity of information and, and value, and everyone has to make their own decisions. It seems like someone who you know you talk about buying versus investing time. You know, it, it seems like a project that if you're not just starting out, if you actually have some capital to invest in it, even if you want to create your database from scratch, you could hire, you know, an intern or something. Yes. Yeah. It's 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 not rocket science what you're doing. It just takes a you know a little bit of investigation and a systematic approach, right? Yes, absolutely. Uh, I just recommend that as long if you hire someone, an intern, don't. Or I made a mistake in that. Uh, or make sure you hire someone who you trust uh, or don't hire a virtual assistant uh, who's not or, or don't two mistakes to avoid don't hire someone who can sell the information to someone else and don't hire someone who you can't at least check the work a little sure because <laughs> it's easy to to not if, if they if they're not invested in the work I mean it's easy to take it yeah, <laughs> it's easy to take it. So it's just a balancing act. It's just a balancing act. And to some degree, you could get around the selling the information thing with a with an agreement, you know, a, a contract that would put some heavy damages on them if they sell your. You yeah. Call it a trade secret, but no one wants to litigate. <laughs> right. Know, it's, right. It's, it, it, you, chances <laughs> are, if they did that, you probably wouldn't want to pursue them over it. But that's one way to cover your butt on it. Yeah. So. Uh, next step is internet research, uh, well basically finding out who the contact is and what the contact information is. You may outsource this, but I just want to add a few pointers for finding email addresses, whether you outsource it or not. Uh, most people probably already know this who are listening, but uh, there's a page on my slide on how to find email addresses that's helpful uh, to go over. Uh, I do this a lot. Uh, obviously there's the website, but also a, a Google search for connecting on LinkedIn. Uh, every first degree connection you have on LinkedIn, mm -hmm. uh, often if someone has their default uh, setting, then you have their email address, which a lot of people don't realize. Mm -hmm. And then I just, if you get someone, if you can find someone uh, else's email at their company, same company, uh, most companies tend to have a pattern uh, in terms of emails. So you can apply that pattern and then just to do someone's email address. Uh, it can be a little bit of a monotonous going through emails, but if you get an uh, email uh, of a decision maker at a large company, uh, it can be worth the time invested, especially for relationship sales where uh, you know the commissions are large. So getting the email of the CEO at medium to large company, you know, it's, it's worth investing the time. And then data.com, uh, the information there is pretty accurate. So I, I'd recommend that, that site. So what is data.com? It's a website where you uh, trade an email to get an email. Oh, okay. Uh, you know, again, this is something that you can outsource, but uh, if you're doing it, I just, I'd recommend using these tools or uh, for your interns. Uh, you can take a – and once you have five emails, you can trade them for five new emails and take those emails. Within the same sort of database? Yeah. Okay. Uh, so it's it's kind of a, it's a tool online where uh, you get if you enter in a piece of information you'll get a point and then you can spend those points to get take out information. That's interesting. Yeah. Okay. Cool. So what's what's next? 
what's next? Next is now you have your database. Now it's time to uh, basically set up a system where you're continuously cold marketing uh, or marketing to the database, uh, even if you don't have a specific reason to. You set up a system to continuously uh, touch them, uh, usually through multiple media, uh, mail, email, and phone calls. Um, this accomplishes two things. One, it just reminds them that uh, you're out there. It establishes name recognition. Two, uh, it allows you to update your database. So if I send an email uh, to, let's say I have you as the uh, head of the firm, and your email might bounce back, or you might reply and say, I'm on vacation, I'll get back to you in a week. But that email signature might have your cell phone. Then I can add your cell phone to my database. And then in a week, I could call you on your cell phone. I might be more likely to uh, get you to pick up. And so my uh, database has just improved a bit. Or I could uh, send a letter to someone uh, else and the letter might be returned and then I might uh, deduce that, that that they've moved and then I would go to their website and have that information confirmed and I figured out that they're at a new mailing address. So just by contacting people uh, you know, continuously through email, mail, and phone uh, you can constantly have the uh, information updated. You might have uh, email bounce back or you might have a receptionist pick up and say that person doesn't work here anymore and you can ask for the new person who's taking their place uh, so it's just important to even if you don't have a, a reason to call to continuously have a system to contact them I usually try to email four to six times a year send uh, two mails each year and two phone calls each year. Uh, just even if I, or I always try to add value every time I do this, but those that's just automatic. And then uh, the goal is to uh, ha accumulate. If you're looking on the slide, this is uh, the system. I'm referring to the the diagram on the second page. Uh, eventually you want to accumulate leads uh, so that you know when you're supposed to call. So let's say uh, I call you and you say, well, don't bother me now because uh, my lease doesn't expire for two years. Then I would put a note in my database saying, you know, lease uh, expires in two years call in one year. So then I'd have an active account uh, that pops up on my screen in one year telling me when to call. And then over the course of, and this, this would happen constantly because I'm constantly sending out these uh, cold notices and people are responding saying, usually with no, but no's not now because of this. And then I take those no's and then turn them into hot. Uh, leads. And then with enough hot leads, those lead to active accounts. I would call you in a year and say, I think your lease is expiring because you told me. Mm -hmm. And by that time, you, you would have received you know, two to three more mail pieces, hopefully each one adding value of some kind, or six more emails, a couple of phone calls. So you know who I am, and you actually have a reason to use me. Uh, and then the rest, hopefully you'll take the call and uh, a meeting. So your email and mail pieces, are those, you know, a, a mass email, like a newsletter and, a, you know, a Christmas card, or are they actual personally directed emails that you're going to send to, to individuals, you know, a couple a day, you know, to your database? Both. Yeah. Uh, I'm glad you asked. Uh I like to do something that I call mass personalization. Uh, 
where I send out uh, in terms of mail and email I send out everything to my entire database but in a way that it looks personalized so you use a what, what does that mean it's and it, it is possible to do this and if you look at my slides you'll see an example of a bad example you'll see a bad example and a good example uh, a bad example is or has a following traits uh, first name isn't used for a mail piece, it's not handwritten. There's no signature. Uh, no value is added for email or mail, so that means that it might be like on Thanksgiving. Did you get those pieces that say like "Happy Thanksgiving"? Sure. Bye. <laughs> yeah, you get it from a bunch of different businesses. Right, and there's nothing wrong with that, but uh, like. For a bad email, it might have a lot of HTML pictures that are always blocked by your spam blocker, a lot of links, no real reason why they're sending it to you, and it might not even be to you. So that's like a bad piece. Uh, a good piece... Before you move on, your example of bad email marketing says, Hello, friend. Happy Flag Day. <laughs> I am writing to offer you no value. Please enjoy the HTML picture above, which failed to download. <laughs> it's, uh, yeah. Uh, <laughs> you know what I'm talking about, yeah, right? Yeah, I'm, I'm glad I didn't get your flag that email. <laughs> <laughs> and then at the bottom it says, if you have read this entire email, you are pliable enough to agree to a meeting over email. When can I come over to your office? <laughs> Sincerely, unsuccessful salesman. <laughs> and then I have pointless link number one, pointless link number two dot com. Uh, I, I get these all the time, and the subject is vague email subject. Uh, again, these are my slides. I think you'll like them. So a good email marketing is one that I, I sent out earlier. Uh, it's usually centered around, or there's a couple different ways to send out value add. It's, it's harder to do. That's why people don't do them. But uh, you can have an event that you're inviting people to. I know you do that a lot. Or you can send a market update, or uh, let's see, I, I have a slide for this uh, for value add content for some ideas. And while you're finding that slide, I, I know I harp on this at, on a lot of podcasts, but I love my event newsletter that doesn't. I, I'm not sending out any any BS. You know, I'll have the latest seize your business episodes or my latest blog, but it's really about inviting people to the next event. People ask to be. People get upset if they're not on that list because right. they're missing out on the value that I'm adding by, you know, letting them. And part of that is throwing good events. You know, yeah. we, me, and you have thrown a lot of events together. And we try to weed out the bad ones that people aren't excited about and get heavy on the good ones. Yeah, yeah. events are are great because people will respond to your emails or at least not ask to be removed from the emails. So number one is invitation to events. Uh, number two is some sort of industry or market update. Uh, as long as you don't overdo it, people will usually accept that. It's harder, but I, I, I know someone, I'm not sure if you're on his list, but uh, Bruce Anderson sends a really good. Letter. Yeah, we've uh, interviewed him for the podcast before. I mean, his are really long, but they're really good. <laughs> they, they're actually, they're not generic um, yeah. market updates. They're actually adding some value. I'll take time to read those. Uh, so, yeah, I don't know. If, uh, email Bruce Anderson, ask for an example of his, because uh, they're just remarkably good. Uh, and then you can also, this is kind of idiosyncratic to, or, to my industry, but sometimes I'll send people surveys asking them about their landlord or property uh, for my own use, and people will take time to vent about their property or things they don't like about the landlord or say good things, and that's helpful for me because I won't take clients to properties they don't, I know tenants don't like, and uh, it's another way to, to you know, contact prospects. Uh, so those are some ideas. Uh, anyway, uh, an example in my slides of a good piece is something I send, or we 
we both co-sponsored an event in the uh, summer or spring or summer or fall uh, with Congressman Roscoe. And I sent out a couple emails just inviting people to that uh, event. And then at the end, I said, P.S., I recently started my own company. Uh, note my new contact information and let me know if my services can be of use to you. Well, and kind of in connection with that event, the brilliant thing that you've started doing is Troy will say, I'm throwing this event, uh, you know, here's here's what I'll trade you. I'll, I'll stick your logo as a sponsor of the event without making you pay any money if you, you know, get it out in your marketing channel. So and I'm happy to do that because I get one more event to put out on my website, one more excuse to email my list. That That's a good excuse. And I don't have to do any of the work in setting up the event. Troy wins because he gets, you know, he gets his – uh, event out to you know a whole new database full of people. So if you have good partners that have good email lists yeah. to work with, that's we just started doing that recently, and that's been I I, I don't know why we didn't do it four years ago. Oh, no, <laughs> that's been a real win win. So uh, just kind of summarizing what we've covered so far: build the database. Step one. Step two: start a system of prospecting to the database through multiple media, uh, email, mail, and phone, and then uh, acquire information. In my industry, uh, I like to acquire who the decision maker is, what the decision date is, what their needs and problems are. Uh, update, continuously update your database and create open tasks to contact them when appropriate uh, in addition to the cold marketing systems you've uh, created. You know, if they, someone says, yes, I'm the decision maker, contact me in two years when my lease expires, you have an open task to do that. And then you gradually create a large funnel of open tasks. That's basically the system. Now, I'm not sure how far you have to go left in your presentation. Would this be a good breaking point to uh, cover the rest in the next episode we do together, or do you have a couple more minutes that you just want to wrap everything up? Uh, I can probably wrap everything up. Uh, I just have, I think, a final couple. Of yeah, go for it. I mean, I, I don't mind uh, taking some more time on this because this is really good information. Um, for mail. Uh, I just want to say I've gotten a good – I, I kind of already harped on this, but I've gotten much better response by hiring a vendor who will – I talked about mass customization. Mm -hmm. uh, what I like to do for mail pieces is uh, similar to email. I like to do a you, – you do a mail merge out of your prospect database so that uh, everyone has a – has their first name, their address uh, inserted into the piece. But with mail, uh, you need to hire a vendor to not only uh, do all the printing and folding and stuffing, but also hire a vendor that will hand write the address, put a first-class – uh, and uh, stamp on the outside and then sign the piece for you. So it looks like it was just addressed to them. I don't know much about stamps. What's uh, what's the deal with the first-class stamp? What, I don't even know what the difference between a first-class sure. and second stamp is. Uh, like the type of stamp that uh, costs 49 cents and not um, the type of stamp that's – you know, the type of stamp that you peel off. Not the, the not the type that's ink printed on the Exactly. Road. Okay. So if you were going to uh, write a, or mail one letter to one person, mm -hmm. and that, you know, that's what the and that's what the letter would look like. Yeah, because you want it to look when it shows up like personal correspondence that exactly. someone actually took the time to send to you, and then you open it, not mass email or not mass mail. Yeah. So. There's ways to have. Uh, 2,000 letters look like a single letter written by you. Mm -hmm. uh, you just have to pay for it, but it's worth the cost. Uh, so that's and the, there's a 
I'm happy to recommend the vendor I use. Yeah, it's, go go ahead because I'm curious about that too. Um, it's actually I'm blanking on the name, so email me. But I think <laughs> it's letterprinter.com or uh, letterfriendly.com. But I have a uh, uh, send me an email Troy at goldengroupcre.com and I'll respond with the vendor. But uh, it tends it's expensive. It tends to be like a uh, dollar fifty per envelope with postage but it's worth it because the open rate is so much more um now, now is that a dollar fifty for the whole mailing or is that just to uh, do the envelope with the uh, i believe so or it might be a dollar eighty okay but that's that's with everything okay um now something i also like to do but this is this might just be for me is when I'm just starting the kind of the year out part of the my process, like someone says my year expires, my lease expires in a year, I've been sending them stuff for a long time, and they say don't contact me, or the decision date is a year out, uh, I will often show up at their office uh, with donuts and a sign and a flyer kind of reminding them who I am uh, and there's a example of this on the slides uh, second to last page uh, with the, it's a pun it says do not forget your office lease expires soon there's three bullet points at the, son at the bottom kind of reminding them who I am and why they should use me and I just I find that it's helpful uh, to get them to take my calls yeah, so pun pun based marketing is what you'd recommend. <laughs> I recommend pun based two things: pun based marketing and sometimes just showing up. Like, I'll, I'll do that. the showing up part. I might I might not follow you down the pun <laughs> road, but <laughs> sometimes I just and I guess what I'm saying is there's a role for selective canvassing. Okay. Like I, by canvassing, I mean door to door sales. Sure. Yeah, well, and if they're if you're they're a warm lead that you're trying to turn into a hot lead and get your face in front of them, nobody nobody hates getting donuts. And actually, I'm making fun of you for your pun, but it's actually a pretty clever uh, clever way to connect the donuts to what you're trying to get them to do. Right. You know, my wife came up with that one, but she I, I oh, like well, it. Well, then I wouldn't have made fun of it <laughs> if I knew that. <laughs> no, no, I'm I'm giving her credit. She's she actually has come up with most of my better ideas in terms of the events. So I'll give her props to that one, for that one. Uh, and then I, we haven't really spoken about connecting over the phone. Uh, I don't really have a lot to say about that because for me that's more of – I don't have any real tricks. It's just a grind that uh, I kind of have to do. I It's more, you know, you make the calls, you get the information, and then you record it. Uh, people – sometimes people will ask me if I have any – advice or tricks I use and I don't use any tricks I just it's just a matter of except record everything you hear put in your database update the database and I guess for me the main point of making calls is well I guess there's a couple points one telling people or showing people that you're not going away mm -hmm. uh, I've had people that uh, you know, have yelled at me the first time, um, told me mildly to go away the second time, the third time told me when their lease expires. <laughs> <laughs> You're kind of just like wearing people down, and then, you know, ten. I'm gonna. I'm in this business for 30 years, and you're just showing them by calling them over and over again that you're just not going away. Uh, not in an annoying thing. Not in an annoying way, because you're only calling twice a year, but just in the same way that an attorney buys an office space as a signal of uh, strength, I guess. Mm -hmm. uh, the calls, you know, if you're if you're a salesman, uh, just showing up and showing your presence over a prolonged period of time is kind of the same. Thing, I guess. And you know what? If they're not ready to talk to you, then I I always do the ask. You know, is it all right if I follow up with you in six months? And no, you know, they know then that they're not going to be bothered for another six months. You know, and they usually give you the yes on that, and then you yeah. can uh, say, yeah, you asked me to follow up with you, and you're not you're not annoying them too much. 
yeah. You know, you have to strike that balance. I try not to annoy people, but you have to show people that you're not fly by night guy either. Sure. There, this isn't the first time. I want when I call someone when their lease expires, I don't want it to be the first call I've made. I want it to be. Uh, you know, yeah, that makes call. a ton of sense. You've already warmed up the warmed up the lead over time, and you they've already got a relationship with you. Mm-hmm. Is there anything else you want to share? Uh, that's. I think that basically covers it. I'm happy to answer any questions. Uh, the, how, how can people reach you? Uh, my phone number is 630-805-2463. Uh, I'm on LinkedIn, Troy Golden. Uh, email address is Troy, T-R-O-Y, at Golden Group, C R E. Dot com. All right. Well, thanks so much for your time today, Troy. I'm yeah. sure we'll have you back very, very soon because it's always, uh, always exciting. And you know, like I said, the first episode we did together, the most listened to episode, <laughs> and this one, this one, you even dug deeper. So I, I think this is even better. So I hope, uh, hope people enjoyed it. And thanks so much for for taking the time to do it with me. Thanks, Scott. All right. Take it easy. Hey, too.